Now, that wasn't exactly a way that Paul wanted to go, was it? No, because see, he was he was just holding the, uh, the coat and consenting uh, to the death of one of the saints, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> this great light appears to him. He's blinded, okay, and he's chosen, and and the Lord God said, uh, you know, he said this is a chosen vessel. He will carry the gospel to the Gentiles. That was his commission, was the Gentiles. Did Paul do that? You bet he did that. But did, did, was, that, was that really what Paul wanted to do? No, that wasn't what Paul wanted to do. Paul wanted to be a Pharisee. But what happened to Paul? Something happened here, didn't it? You say, well, yeah, would it happen to you if a great, something like that took place that took place with Paul? Exactly. Now, let's, let's examine that. Some of us, it takes a different way of God visiting us to get our attention, all right? Now, if you've listened to me do the thing on the angels, you would heard me say I'm 20 years old, I'm standing with my back to my car, I'm drunk as a monkey because I've been to a, to a, a college campus a drunk that afternoon, and bless God, I hear a noise, and I turn around, and there's the angel of God. Okay? Got my attention full time. So, but, but, but that, does that, is that the way God does everybody? No. Some of you were much easier for God to draw into the kingdom. I was a bit boneheaded about the whole thing, to say the least. But, but at the same time, bless God, God takes us on an individual basis because we're all unique, one from another. He created us all differently, and thank God that He did. But He only created one version of His Word. And that version is for everybody. Again, the problem gets to down to being most of us are unteachable because most of us think that we are capable, and this is due to the charismatic movement that we were told, nobody guide me but the Holy Ghost, and I'm going to read, and I'm going to pray, and God's just going to tell me what to do. And we went on the greatest roller coaster ride that any, uh, any generation that's ever been on this church probably got to go on. We're still on it. Don't know who Jesus Christ is if he walked in, as I said, and sat down next to most of us. But we know everything there is to know. We're ever learning, but never able to come to the fullness of the truth. What's that all about? It's all about me, myself, and I, and it's not got anything to do with God. So in order to be led, in order to be led by, by God, then what we've got to do is get ourselves into a position of receiving and understanding that we first have to will to want to be led. After, after we come to the place of the conversion uh, from, from death unto life, meaning receiving Yeshua, the, the Mashiach, Messiah, then, bless God, then we, then we are lining ourselves up to become recipients to be guided by His Spirit. All right? Now, uh, and, I, and I love this. Let's go, let's go back over to Romans book of Romans, the 8th chapter. Now, the 26th verse, Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit, now notice that's a capital S, meaning the Spirit of God. Likewise, the Spirit of God also helpeth our infirmities. So the Spirit of God helps our infirmity, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit, capital F, S, itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now let's stop and think about that for a minute. Now, one way that you have, that you're going to hear me when we get in this structured prayer beat on big time, of being able to pray where you're not praying amiss, is to pray in the Spirit. Okay? That's one way you can do that. But no, because we want to know what we're saying uh, to God, we want to hear us say it so we know that God understands it. Honey, God knows the thoughts and the intents of your heart before you ever open that big clam baked outfit that's called a mouth to start talking. He already knows. All right? So, so 
but the, the Spirit of God helps our infirmity. And it says, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, God is making intercession for you. When your spirit becomes connected with the Spirit of God through the conversion process of accepting Messiah, then, bless God, you are now doing what? The Spirit of God is making intercession for you. What are you saying? You are being contacted by God then. And God is trying to guide you then. Your spirit man knows everything there is to know. Let me, let me, let me just say that if you can get your spirit man in tune with the Spirit of God, you have a spirit that lives, uh, bless God, in this body, okay? And you have a soul. But the fact of it is, your spirit is in connection, once you're regenerated, to the Spirit of God. Okay, so God is making an intercession for you. It has to come from His Spirit, your spirit, into your body. That's the reason why, that bless God, that there's all this stuff that's going on. That's the reason why you can wake up in the morning, if you'll pray at night and pray the right way, you can wake up in the morning and all of a sudden know the answer to things that you've been asking to get from God. Again, I just love it when people write or, or they call and say, oh, oh, uh, if, 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 if the prophet's really a prophet, I want him to tell me what my true call is. I want the prophet to tell me something that, that only me and God knows. If he's a, Get out of here. I'm not into soothsaying. I'm not into, bless God, being your crystal ball reader. You know, I used to tell people, well, I'd check and I'd say, whoa, my crystal ball, the, the, the batteries are down on it. I would have to recharge the batteries to the crystal ball if it was going to work, because it wouldn't be the Spirit of God. Now, when you look at this, and then you go down into this next verse, and he that, that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Uh-oh. What is it? That maketh intercession... For the saints according to the will of God. So it's all being worked out. You know who messes that being worked out up? You and I. You and I. We mess it up. It's being worked out. It's all taken care of. The intercession's there. For your infirmities? Yes. So when, bless God, you get tangled up in these things and say, Glory God, for your stripes I receive him, guess what? It's done. The Spirit of God will begin to make that intercession, and it's going to be there. It's going to work. Now, well, I want to, you know, I just want to know this. I have stood on this thing called the Word here, you know, for six months, and bless God, I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get into the, 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 the but uh, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I know what they're saying. They still haven't received the physical manifestation of the healing. Listen to me closely. Once you ask in the spirit realm, it's over. It happened. It's done. The physical manifestation of that, there could be a lot of things that gets involved with that. Okay? Uh, uh, bless God, it could be things up, up the generational line from your forefathers. That could be a problem. It, it could be, bless God, you yourself. The bitterness, unbelief, uh, doubt and unbelief, that, 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 you know, unforgiveness. Uh, those are things of bless God that... that, that that absolutely will hold back the physical manifestation of miracles and healings. Now, the thing that you want to understand about all this that I think is, that is absolutely incredible about God is that God is able. And so what God, what God is really saying to us is, look, if you'll just play by the right rules here, we can, we can get this done because I am making an intercession from me to your spirit man, and turn your spirit man is going to do what? Deal with you. But if you're waiting for God, and most of us are thinking we've got to have a vision, a dream, a visitation of some sort, an audible voice, a small, still voice, we've got to have something happening, or we're just not spiritual. Now again, I'm going to tell you, get scriptural, the spiritual thing will take care of itself. But if you never get scriptural, you're never going to really, you're never going to reach that, that, that place of spirituality that you think that you want so badly at this point, which probably you won't end up wanting at all. So, 
Once the sp your spirit and everything begins to work out, and 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 your permanent are, and like I said, so how long does it take? Do you realize something? I've known people that have had cancer. That bless God that it was a year after the time that I come to pray for them. They carried around that old dirty handkerchief on them. Now you can wash those, you know. You can't wash the anointing out. But they carried around those old dirty handkerchiefs, and and all of a sudden they come back in and 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 make a comment to me such as. Well, it took 12 months, but uh, I'm, I'm full, I am fully healed. But I stood on the Word, I didn't doubt, and I'm, I'm fully healed. What's that about? They stood on the Word of God. Again, whether you live or you die, that's immaterial in itself. The fact of it is, you belong to Him, no matter what. You were set on this earth and commissioned by God from the foundations of the world for certain things to happen. Most of you in this room need to thank God that you get to stay here in America until we go to Israel, okay? Because there is another world out there where preachers, and then this brother here is getting ready to go to Nigeria. He came out of Nigeria, what, 28 years ago, right? And now him and his wife's getting ready to go back to Nigeria to minister. People are saying, oh, that's dangerous over there. No, it's not dangerous over there. If you're seeking the face of God and God's told you to go, Bless God, there's enough, not enough people out there in that harvest to start out with. You know why? We're hiding away in America because we want to be superstars as preachers. We want to be on television. Oh, Brother Decker, if I can just get on TV. You know, well, I, well, not one station, Brother Decker, but 20 stations. How about internationally, Brother Decker? What about doing that? Enough is enough. Okay, we've had all the superheroes we can stand. we got all the preachers owning $8 million airplanes and uh, two or three million dollar homes and two or three of them scattered around America go stay in $30,000 penthouse apartments when they come to your city to preach. We've had all that we need. We're, we don't need superstars. What we need is God's Word in us. That's what we need, okay? And that's not going to come because you get in a congregation of 20,000 people. In fact, uh, that's what most of the problem is. A lot of this stuff of getting in these big congregations they're not teaching people anything. It's a social moment. Oh, look at us. Ooh, yeah. Well, I'm on the intercession team, Brother Decker. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we're the intercession people. Well, I got news for you. A guy got, uh, wrote to me here uh, last week, getting ready to build, I think it was a 20, actually $22 million, I think that's what he said, uh, extension to the church because it was growing so much. This fellow had been there for lots and lots of years, and he was a treasurer, he was an elder of the church, and he said something that was real important to me. He said, Brother Deckard, we quit praying for the sick, we quit having all their calls months and months ago. He said, I went to the pastor, and I said to the pastor, I said, why don't we do that anymore? He said, because we're moving past that. Yeah, we're moving past that, and if you don't like it, there's the door. We're doing what God's telling us to do. And he was asking me, you know, he said, well, what should I do? And I said, you already know what to do. You don't need me to be telling you what to do. I wouldn't tell you anyway. I said, you follow what your heart's telling you what to do. See, again, the people are waiting to hear a voice. Folks, that voice is continually there. It's there. It's right now there. And you just need to relax. Because, again, what happened to us we jump from that type of guidance into this thing that it's got to be, as I told preachers, you know, uh, today a full gospel preacher, if he doesn't say God said, or if he doesn't have a vision, a dream, a visitation, something taking place of the supernatural, he might as well pack up and move down the street because he's not going to have anybody. The people want to be entertained by the supernatural. And that's a bunch of hooey. Okay? See, that's the reason that, uh, that I, you just, I mean, and it, it's always been this way. That now, if God tells me to give you a word of knowledge, you'll get one. The odds of that happening probably are about, they, it's absolutely zero with me. Because again, why, do, do you, why would you need a word of knowledge? Now, and what, there's times when a word of knowledge is important and is, it, 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 it'll, save, it'll save people's lives even. But just bless God for you to come here this weekend and me to go around the room and give everybody a word. You'd be surprised the people that call and want to know, will, will the prophet be given uh, individual words this week? No, the Donna said, no, he won't be. And I, don't, and I don't intend to. Now, God may tell me to, and then I'll, I'll do that. 
Why? Because, folks, laying on of hands is for the babies. Is anybody listening to me today? We got a bunch of bottle-sucking, diaper-wearing saints that think they're all growing up and they don't know squat about the things of God. Don't know squat about it. If they did, we would have moved past this thing years and years ago. But we didn't because the saints wanted into the... The supernatural. I got news for you. You need to be led by what God's trying to lead you by, and that's your spirit. And you need to get down, and you get you. Like I said, this thing of saying God said. I hope you. you I hope you've learned something out of all that. Most most of them didn't. Most of them went right back. You know, I told I told the people in California last weekend. I said I'm going to tell you something. You come up here and get this line. You get in this line. I lay hands on you and break that curse out of your life. For saying God said and, and God didn't say. I said, you go back out here and you start this junk up again. I said, I'm going to guarantee you, you're going to die. You're going to die long before your time. Because I said, I speak that even there by the anointing of God at that point in time. Why? Somewhere this thing's got to stop. Somewhere it's got to stop. Like I said, all the way down to people saying, there won't be a Super Bowl next. That cuts deep. <laughs> to an old athlete like me, that's 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 cutting deep. Okay, no Super Bowl. What's going on? It is the end of the world. Okay, <laughs> there will be a Super Bowl. As I said next year. What's that about? It's somebody wanting to be a hero. Heroes set dates and times. People that want to be heroes are going to give you a date and a time. This year, that's going to happen. I told, I, you know, when I was in California last time, I told them, I said, You're, it's going to begin. I didn't know when it's going to begin. I never know when it's going to begin. It's none of my business when it's going to begin. It's going to begin to have trouble with, the, with this Fertile Valley and the, the, the vegetables and the fruit that's in it. They've already been having trouble in it. Like I said, they got, a, they got some kind of a fungus on the grapes, and they don't know what to do with it. What is that? That was direct judgment. When I spoke that a year ago in California, I told them, I said, I got up in the middle of the night and I prayed and God said to pronounce judgment in California. I said, you listen closely as the prophet tells you what's coming. Now, that's what prophets do. See, it's none of our business to have the timing unless God makes us give time. The only time I've ever done that, as I said before, is when I've in the third world had to go in front of a president, a king, a queen, or a prime minister and had to say, thus saith the mouth of God, and I've had to leave a sign. And in three days, this is going to happen. Three days, this is going to happen. And those signs have never fallen to the ground. They happen. After the, after three days after I left, uh, left that nation. So, so but, but you know, there again, folks, it, it's really, really time that the church wakes up and understands that God just doesn't do that through everybody. And yet somehow, we've been in enough of this, these, whatever these meetings are, everything from the gold dust falling down out of the, whatever that is, the diamonds being found on the floor, we have bought into so much of that stuff that we think somehow we have arrived in the world and we don't even, we don't even know how to touch the other side. And like I've said, most of what's taken place today are familiar spirits, not even the Spirit of God at all. And that's sad because people are being drawn away. But, but, but bless God, our place is to what? Our place is to follow after and, and to do the things. We're going to talk now uh, for the rest of this session about where God and man meet. We're going we're to try to bring you to the realization, again, where you look at your own hearts, because within your hearts lies the answer to all this thing. It, it, it's going to be the difference between you becoming balanced in this thing, it's going to be uh, determined as to how you're going to treat this. You know, I often talk to ministry like they're the Barney Fife's of the world. You know, Barney Fife had a badge, a bullet, and a gun, and he thought he, you know, he was it, right? And, and a lot of ministry, when they start into the ministry, they got a badge, a bullet, and a gun, and they're here I am, you know. 
stand back, I'm taking over now. And, and so I always caution young ministries to, to understand what their position is. When properly taught, young ministry will go out into this thing and be able to develop because they'll understand what we're even doing here today. Now, uh, the, the, let's, uh, let's look at the, the three different ways uh, the, the, definitely that you come to God. Self-interest, uh, self-seeking, uh, God because of personal need. You know, often that's, that's, that's the way we seem to think we found God. As I said, we didn't find Him, He found us. But the fact of it is we get a personal need. Very few people come to God because they didn't have anything else to do. Right? I can't raise my hand. It was just the thing to do. Usually we have a need, a uh, 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 fear of loss, or, or, or what we can gain. You know, I've had a lot of people tell me that, now, Brother Deckard, I'd love to come to your church. All right? When I was in the church business. But, <clears throat> you know, I have a business, and, and, and what I really need to do is to rub elbows with the banker, hmm, the mayor, and don't forget the judge, and they, they all attend uh, the First Church of the Righteous down the street down there. And I made that up, of course. And, and so I'm going to uh, attend down there because the benefits would be greater for me. Now, that's that type of person. And you say, oh, are there people like that? Obviously, there are. What do you think begats a crowd? A crowd. See, the, the thing that I keep talking about, these fellowships that we're, gonna, that we're developing across America... Uh, these fellowships are going to stay small and by design. Because what we want is, we want, we want to go back to the family type of a church setting. What do you call a synagogue, a church, whatever you want to call it will be fine. Uh, as I said, right now, for any better use, use of the language, we're just going to say fellowships. And those fellowships will stay somewhere between 30, 50 maybe, maybe this big, uh, but the reason they're going to, we want them small is so that we can interact with each other. We can really get down to this thing of loving each other, and when you've got a problem, the rest of the people are going to be there. See, that's what the, the book's all about. The book is about being rightly related first to God, then related rightly one to another. And when you get in a big church, and because of the way our worlds operate in circles that we go in today... Most of us, bless God, the only time we ever see anybody in the church is when what? We show up at the church. Okay? So the fellowships are going to be set so that we can interact with each other. When somebody's sick, people are going to go visit. When somebody needs food, people are going to get food there. In other words, we are going to again fulfill. When somebody, you see somebody sick, you go visit them. When you see somebody that needs clothes, you get them clothes. We're going to begin to fulfill Scripture. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, the, the, the folks that isn't enough to send uh, $10 or $20 uh, overseas for a kid. I mean, that's needed, obviously, but that's not, that's not what this thing's about. This thing's about meeting the needs of the people that are around you that are trying to walk upright before God, that love God just as much as you love God. Now, if, if, now most of us have been involved in organized churches, and you know exactly what I'm saying. If you're not within what's called an inner circle of that church, you're not going to get in. You're just in a big church, and all the hoop de law and all the things that they have, and after all, we have a meeting room right after Sunday morning. You go out and have free donuts and coffee and fellowship, and you do all this stuff, and don't forget, we got our million-dollar gymnasium out the side on Thursday night that everybody, we have our basketball games, and the children come, and we've even designated cheerleaders, and it goes on and on and on. What is it? It's theatrics. We couldn't produce the power of the anointing, so we've now got ourselves over into this thing called a social church, a church where we are entertaining the people, where the people can come and, bless God, do what from their own self-interest, if not careful, get themselves in a real bind, okay? So one way, anyway, that you come to God is through self-interest. Another way is, bless God, uh, law, and I put down here, law and performance, uh, and and uh, one other thing, you can have b b bad motives about coming to God too. Uh, and I think that often, again, as I said, and which probably a number of times already this morning, it, it lies within your heart. You have to really ask yourself, what, what are the motives behind it? Let me tell you why I'm saying that to preachers. 
I have done this for 31 long years. Okay? I am a prophet. I'm a preacher of righteousness. And that's all I know. That's all I want to do. There's nothing else for me. And if it was, I wouldn't want it. Okay? But it is the most thankless job that there is on the face of this earth. When Paul said that we are but filthy rags under the feet of the people, Paul knew what he was talking about. We get kicked. It's, it's our fault when it's wrong. It's our fault sometimes when it's right. It's our fault if this doesn't work out. Somebody has a bad day, they want to come in and take it out on the pastor. And then they all of a sudden, because they can't get along with their husband at home, then they come home they, in the church, they can't get along with the brothers and sisters at church. It's a thankless job being in the minister. It's not, and, and so therefore... After 31 years of this medlam, I look at, in a very questionly fashion, at people that tell me, I want to be in the ministry. I'm going, why? And worse than that, when people start saying, well, I have a prophetic call in my life, brother. I know you've already noticed that. Well, I, I hate to tell them I didn't. You know, most of the time I just kind of stand there and don't say anything. Why would anybody want to do this? You don't have friends when, it, when you're this. This doesn't make friends. What this makes is people mad. <laughs> gives them a chance to get glad, though, right? I li I li no, I like that part. They get mad. It gives you an opportunity to get glad. But now, you, you know, why, why of all those offices, why in the world would you pick? Uh, you know, I've always said an evangelist was the right office. You know, as for, of course, everybody's got their own way of looking at things. Of course, like I said, grass always looks greener across there than what I do. But you see, uh, so it, it, it gets down again into the hearts uh, of people. People that minister, they minister, and if they've been in it very long, they understand how thankless it is. You get kicked upside of people that you have loved, you have prayed for, you have fasted over, and there they go out the door pointing their finger and calling you the devil and believing what they're saying to be the truth. So what are the gains to this as ministry? Let me tell you. The gains has been ministry is the furtherment of you into God's kingdom on this earth. The, 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 the only uh, blessings that I can see about ministry is the day that you get to go to heaven. People ask me, so well, aren't you nervous about going when you go to the third world and the people shooting at you and trying to kidnap you and they're trying to hide you and they're killing other people thinking they're, it's you? Doesn't that make you nervous? No, it doesn't make me nervous because i got news for you. If it's my day to go home, thank God I'm done with all this, okay? And I, I mean, I, I love my family, and I miss my family, but the fact of it is, folks, we were born to go to heaven, okay? So I, I, I have no fear of death, but, but when, it comes to, when it comes to most of this stuff, you look at it, and, and you go, you know, I'm a minister, I'm going to have to stand before God, I'm going to have to give account for all of you. All of you stiff neck. I don't like that. Okay? I'm always saying to the Lord, well, I don't like that. That's not fair. Why'd you put that in the book? That's the way it is. And see, that's the part that I can't seem to get through the noggins and into the hearts of most young ministry. You are responsible for those people. And if you screw it up, it's better that you tie a millstone around your neck and you jump off into the ocean then for that day that you'll have to stand before the Lord our God and give account. That's how serious it is. It's a serious matter. No one should take it lightly. And I'm going to tell you what. I know what. You know why how God does that, don't you? He baits us. Yeah. See, I got baited. And I thought, oh, there's nothing, there's nothing to be a prophet. You just, you know, listen to what God did. Just do it. Well, there's nothing to that. And then all of a sudden I get these assignments I don't want to do. I said, now wait a minute. God said, now wait a minute. You're the one that said that you would succumb under, under my authority, my word. Yeah, okay, go do that. I said, but God, you didn't tell me that I was going to have to go do that. I was real happy over here doing this, see? And again, major prophets are always so far out in front of the rest of the church that the rest of the church think that they are the Antichrist. See, for no other reason, and, and that's not the reason, but if there was no other reason, you could understand this being called an Antichrist spirit 
would want you'd, you'd want to come see what it's all about if you knew anything about about the way this thing operates anyway, because that's what it's going to look like to the to the rest of the church. It's going to look wrong. They're going to talk about it. They're going to talk against it. They're going to do everything they can do. Why? Because folks, you're looking at what's going to take uh, is going to absolutely cause the church to go out of business if they don't stop this thing. What they don't know, we're not going to put the church out of business. We're just looking for those within the church ranks that belong to Ephraim. That's all that we're doing. We're not trying. We're not trying to destroy the church. And the church is uh, the church. Do you realize something? If you know who you are, you can't be intimidated. Okay. Now, the church doesn't know who they are, or this I couldn't be intimidating them as greatly as they're getting intimidated. Couldn't. But they don't know. If they knew, they just struggle. Okay, oh, well, you know the same thing that they got into him. Remember in Paul's day, you remember the he said well, the brother said, well, just you know, just leave him alone. If, you know, if it's God, it'll stand. It'll be all right. If it's not, it'll fall to the ground. Why don't we do that today? Because we don't know who we are like they knew who they were. If we knew, the, listen to me. I'm giving you wisdom here, and that's the reason all this persecution, all this talk, all this backbiting takes place is because they're intimidated because they don't know that they're right. When you know you're right about something, bless God, you, could, you couldn't come and talk me out of what I know or, or, or intimidate me of what I'm ministering. You couldn't. There's just not enough hours in a day to do that. Why? Because I know. It's here, okay? It's not there within the church or the church wouldn't even pay any attention to this. And yet I think I told the story. Was I right uh, when I said uh, that was a, a church of about 5,000? Oh, a thousand. Okay, well then that, that men numbers. You always, that's the reason I ask. I, it didn't sound right when I said it. So, but a thousand is a big church, and, and so somebody stands up. The preacher stands up and says, "Hey, you know that guy's a false prophet. Don't go down there to where this Tom Deckard's at, this so-called prophet." Now, what's that about? Because he's intimidated. He's afraid. He does. He, you know, he doesn't know that 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 bless God that what he believes is the truth. Maybe that's the truth. So we've got to keep the people here. So what do we do? We use that age-old, oh, that's an Antichrist spirit. Well, <laughs> they won't know the Antichrist when he comes either. So, all right, doubt. Law and performance, number two. Religion is defined as externals and traditional. Boy. It, it, you know, and, and it is that way. It, it's always ex, 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 externals because of what goes on outside the church, and of course, traditional is what goes on in the church, which means that we try to obey it, but there's so much that goes on we don't know. Uh, the performance to, in order to what? To be accepted and to be acceptable. So in other words, you better go to church, act like everybody acts, all right? The burden of the law was a theme of the Pauline epistles, and uh, we weren't going to get into that this morning because we, we do a study on that. Uh, and bless God, we need to understand something that, that number three, love is God coming in the flesh. God loved the world, so he came. Okay, it's that simple. We know that. So what this is doing is, it's, it's, it's showing you how man and God met through all this. Understanding each other of these may determine your success or your failure with God, as long as you walk on the face of this earth. Now, self-interest is, is the theme for today. Get all you can get as soon as you can get it, and, and bless God, be, and, that's, and that's what this, most of what the, the church is today is self-interest. Now, what if the Lord Yeshua had been into self-interest? He wouldn't have said, Lord, let this cup pass for me. He would have passed the cup, he would have headed out of the country, and he would have gone over in Egypt and hid for a while. Okay? No, no, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. See, it was the Father's interest, not his. And, and what, again, most of us have got, got the thing backwards. We, we get to thinking somehow that we are more important than the rest of you. Now, God loves you. Boy, He loves me. Mm -hmm. I can get away with a little sin. And you know, that's usually what we get into. We see how much sin we can get into without, bless God, losing all of whatever it is that God has given us. Instead of recognizing there's more tomorrow than there is today. Repeat that. There's more tomorrow than there is today. And that's what we've got to understand about this thing. We 
we are on an ever-learning journey. The learning never ceases. That's the, now listen to me, that's the reason denominations should never have been started. Because a denomination is only revelation hour, uh, revelation uh, knowledge, I'm sorry, in the, in the hour of which God has that generation. And you can look at it as I teach transition, and you can see it all the way down through time. The, and the problem is, with that, is, is the fact that people get caught up into that and get to believe in, well, you know, that, that this is what, this is what this is. So because of that, people can't stay open because they, they, that their self-interest becomes in that doctrine. And so they're not open to the things that God is trying to do in them. And so therefore, they do what? They miss those things. Now, is that regulated by God? Well, uh, yes and no. I, you know, I, I think that God has let a lot of those kind of things come. And I think the reason He's let it come to us is because He wants us to, it's always us making a choice. God's never making anybody do anything. God doesn't strong arm us. What God does is give choice. So many times we're making these choices, and bless God, you know, uh, we get ourselves in a position that, uh, that doesn't seem to learn very well uh, 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 when it's all over. Now, the law today presently is a strange mixture for the church. Now, we want the Ten Commandments, we think, on the churchyards, but we don't want the law. Uh, you know, you, that is the law. See, I, uh, over and over and over again, I say to people, I say, that's the law. That, the Ten Commandments. You know why? I said it last night. Say it again. The law was set first to get us rightly related to Him, the Lord God. Secondly, to get us rightly related and to keep us that way one to another. Just that simple. Just that strong. So when it says, Thou shalt not kill, you don't kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery, you don't commit adultery. What is it? It's keeping the relationships right. And, and, and so you go down through all that, uh, uh, the things that God said in the law. But yet at the same time, we've been free from law. Now we've been through that, and I'm not going to spend any time today in this, uh, in this session uh, or, or this weekend uh, talking about that. If you need to know about that, that we've, got, we've got material on the back that will explain to you that Paul was not against the law. Now, performance, uh, and there's a performance trap. Uh, now, the, and that, now let's tell you something. And I want you to understand that as far as you can today. We've got to get ourselves in a place of understanding that it's not blessings without obedience. And that's, what, that's where we're at. We're at a place of thinking we can have blessings without the obedience part. That's the reason I'm so hard about Deuteronomy 28. That's the reason I'm so hard about saying God made a covenant. And within that covenant, he says, there's things that if, if, if you will do this, I will do that. If you don't do this, I can't do that. See, his word, his word is final authority. And that's the reason I said that most of us live in the latter part of the book of, uh, of, the book of Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, in all the curses, because we don't, we're not covenant people anymore. Oh, but I belong to the New Covenant. No, you don't. You belong to the New Testament in the blood. That's what you belong to. The blood has now been shed by the Lamb of God, Yeshua, Mashiach, that we can get to heaven. That's what He came and did. We made the church got in there and decided to take that away from it. But if you go back and study the history, all the way back, all the way back to the, to the, to, uh, uh, the time of when Christ left this earth, you'll begin to understand what was going on within all that and how it got stolen from us. But you cannot have blessings without obedience. You've got to get obedient. And somehow we want to be disobedient, and then we expect God to do something. Then, out of our sin, which is disobedience, something happens. There's, there's a tragedy comes in our life. The phone starts ringing. Help! Help! You've got to do prophets. You've got to pray. Help! All this hell's come home to visit. Help! Listen to me. Hell does not come home to visit when you're obedient to God. Okay? And now, if you're not going to be obedient to God, you've got to understand something. You may be smart enough to repent for your sin, but there's still a penalty that you're going to pay for the sin. It's in the book. Okay? And people need to understand that. 
You think that you think you have got a, a you have got a free pass, and you can go out here and sin and say, "Oh golly gee, Jesus, forgive me," and you're forgiven. Yes, you're forgiven. Say, "Thank God for grace." Thank God for grace. Boy, I guess. And and because of that that factor, we got ourselves into one of these things of thinking we're going to have we can be disobedient and we still can be blessed. But all we got to do is say, "Oh golly gee, Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive me." And it does, yeah, you're forgiven. The problem again is you're going to pay a penalty. Why? Folks, if you don't pay the penalties, you won't ever learn anything. Can you understand that? If you, it, you, it, that, you know, I'm sorry, it takes pain to be able to gain, okay? And when the, rem- I, I did a, a years ago, I did a, if I can say this all at one time, I did a piece of ministry and it was, when the pain of remaining the same becomes greater than the pain of, of change, you'll change. You hear what I'm saying? And that's really where we're at right now with this entire new movement. The pain of remaining the same has become greater than the pain of change. And it's easier for us to have peace come into our hearts, into our lives, into our families, into our bodies, than bless God to fight this thing any longer. But so to do that, then we're going to have to go back, and, what, and, and that's what we're doing here. We're trying to take you back, and we're trying to be certain that you understand God's rules so that you can participate, you can be blessed. You, we can get the ministers that are going to minister it within this thing, doing things right with the right motives of their hearts, and we can bring this thing on to further the kingdom of God to get us back to Israel. And yes, it is a physical going back to Israel, okay? Now, the third thing I put down was the word love. Um, it means we finally comprehended that God set His love upon us. And I think that's, that was probably pretty well put for myself. We finally comprehended that. He, uh, we can do nothing to earn that love, and mistakes and failures do not cause us to make that love cease. He loves us. But because He loves us, what's He going to do? He's going to, and He has to, correct us. Can you grab onto that? In other words, and you know, Paul said correction at the time. He said, whoa, nobody wants to be corrected. Nobody does. There's nights that, bless God, that angel will show up then in my bed, and I know he knows that I'm peeking out to see, you know, What's going on? And there's some nights I just like to act like I wasn't going to wake up. That don't work either, okay? <laughs> Try that. But when he comes and he corrects me, I know that, that I am not being a father pleaser. And in order for you to get somewhere with the... Let's go back to when you were a kid. Remember when you were 16 years old. That's been a day or two for me, but I remember. Now, I wanted to use the car on Saturday night. Okay, just to merely to go down to the hot dog stand, the A and W root beer stand to be exact, and go down and see what everybody was doing. I feel a little important because I got I got Pop's car. You know what I mean? Got her all go out, and I'd get out there on Friday evening, and I would spit shine that car. Dad, he'd come home and he'd get out of, out of his work uh, vehicle, and he'd walk up and he'd say, "What are you doing, son?" I said, "Dad, I'm cleaning the car up for you for the weekend." I said, I just know, I, I just know that, that you and mom uh, w- appreciate having a clean car. And I said, I'm out here, I'm cleaning this thing out, and I'm doing it. And he'll say, on the way by, I said, well, good job, boy, you're doing a good job. And he'd just go in the house. I'm thinking, ah, I have now planted the proverbial seed for the keys, okay? <laughs> because I've got my dad happy, you know? And I mean, he, now, if, if he's not happy, you don't ask for the keys. I mean, never, we all got smart real quick on that deal. So I get out there and I work and I work and bless God, it's getting dark. And my mom says, it's time for you to come on in to, 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 to eat. And I said, Mom, I, I'm going to finish this because I want it to be right. Oh, she said, she turned to my dad and said, well, he'll be in a little later. I'll warm it up. said, he wants that right. Planted another seed. Yes, I did. So I finally get in the house and I'm thinking, now, how do I approach this thing? Because I've cleaned the car up, I've worked all those hours. I think I'm in. I think I'm in position. So I said, "Dad, 
I was just wondering that, that, that maybe tomorrow night, bins that is Saturday night, notice that word bins, bins that is Saturday night, that I might be able to take the family vehicle, drive down, and it wasn't but just a few blocks, to the A&W root beer stand, park there, and me and the fellows sit there and drink an A&W root beer. And of course, look at a few of the pretty ladies that say they drive by. And Dad said, well, sure, son, you worked like that, you did that car. What did I do? I pleased my father first. And that is a great lesson, folks, because that's what we're not doing. We're thinking that our Heavenly Father is just standing around, give me this, give me that, I want this, or I'm not going to church next week. I did, well, it's not working for me, so why should I go to church? Well, now, if I was to get that, I'd, pro- I'd go to church next week. na 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 you know something? You're not going to get anything from the Father like that because you're not pleasing Him. What you're doing is you're being a brat. You're being an egotistical idiot as far as I'm concerned, but probably brat would be a nice word that maybe God would think about. But you're not going to receive very much at all from your Heavenly Father like that. So it's the way in which we approach Him and it's the understanding of us being what? Father pleasers. Now, if you are, now every family, if those of you that have raised big families, you can jump up and say amen very quickly to this. Now, if you've had two or three kids in the family, you still will understand there's just some of those kids were no trouble at all, were they? And then there was others of those kids that I'm telling you, it would have taken a baseball, a Louisville slugger, upside the head about three times a week, and it still wouldn't have straightened them out. Okay? Now, what's that about? Well, that's about us. That's about the church, and that's about the way that you and I are. That, bless God, there's some of us that all we're going to do is please God. And it doesn't matter, we're, gonna do, we're just going to please God. And we want to please God. We, we get up every day with the idea of pleasing God. Not up every day what we can get from God, but how can we please Him? How can I please the Father? Now listen closely. When it comes to the time of the supernatural warfares that take place, Those father pleasers are going to be able to walk before the father and say, Father, I'm really going through some stuff here that you see. And Lord, I would appreciate the fact of you being my covering, being my God, and the fact that I petition you to lift this problem, intervene in it. Those people are going to come a whole, whole, whole lot further up the line, getting it done, than those of you that keep, wah, 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 wah. okay? Why? Because the Father knows exactly the minute you get that He fulfills that for you, you're going to go right back out here, you're going to get right back in the same bunch of malarkey that you came out of, and He knows that. We don't, as humans, we don't learn very well. We don't learn through the object lessons of which God God gives us, all right? Okay, so, so uh, when, when you understand that, that then while we were yet in sin or sinners, God set His love upon us. We know that. You finally met someone who can outguess you and outthink you. Why? Because He knows what? The purpose and the intent of our hearts. You know, this right here is what determines your sin more than this right there. Why? You can make mistakes up here, but it's the, it's the, it's the intent of your heart. See, that, that, that's what God is, God, God, oh, He listens to what you're saying. I don't misunderstand me. But it's here. Is your heart right? Again, is your motive right? You know, in order for us to probably get you moved further into this thing, probably what you need to do, and Donna, Donna used to do this herself, you need to begin to write things down and put little sticky, you know, little sticky notes on the dash of your car, on your refrigerator, on your mirror in the bathroom. And every day, read that and, and, and have on it, check the motive of my heart. Check the motive of my heart. And begin every day to judge yourself. Judge yourself. Look at yourself. Do you really like where you're at with God? Do you really like being sick? Do you really like being poor? Do you really like being having no peace? Do you really like being depressed? Do you, do you like that? 
And if you say, no, I don't like that. Now, if you're happy with everything and you've got peace inside of you, then praise God because you're pleasing the Father somewhere. Okay? But if you don't, there's something wrong with your relationship with the Father, which in turn does what? Directly, directly in turn causes your blessings to either be yea, yea or nay. Okay? And that's and, and, and you want to grab onto that and remember. Now God's big enough to do what? To love you. And all of your pain of failure, condemnation and guilt. He's big enough to love you through it. Why? Because he's always there. He is like an earthly father. An earthly uh, let me tell you something. Your earthly father at times, my my dad said what he meant and meant what he said. My dad never bothered to saying don't do that twice, well known within the family. When dad said don't do it, you have one, you have one choice, either to do it again and get your butt tanned or just not do it. Now, again, pain causes us somehow to gain, doesn't it? So in my case, I learned very quickly, it's just better not to do it. Because my, and you know, have you been around people that are kids? Now, now, Joey, don't do that. Joey kept it. Now, Joey, don't Joey, don't do that. And Joey, if you do that again, I'm going to warp you, Joey. And Joey knows he's not getting a warping anyway. So Joey just goes on and does it. See, we're an awful lot like that as adults when it comes with God. We get into this stuff, and all of a sudden, again, we get to thinking God's going to bless us above and beyond all the junk that we're doing. No, he's not. He can't. You know why? Because if he did, he'd have to rewrite the book every day. He's got one set of rules. He's got one people. And bless God, if you want to keep the rules, you're going to be blessed. You're going to defile the rules. You're going to be cursed. And he says, cursings or blessings, you choose. Life or death, you choose. So see, the choices are ours. And when you get to heaven, he's not going to say, when I feel sorry for you, and I, I, I really, feel, you know what he's going to say? If you had adhered to the word, none of that would have happened in your life. But you didn't adhere unto the word. What you did was you selfishly, you selfishly come under an, uh, come under a fictitious law that you wrote yourself. And that's going to be, unfortunately, that's uh, that's going to be uh, what's going to happen uh, to most of us. Now, recognize the difference between unworthy and unprofitable. Okay. It was unprofitable because I did not obey when God spoke to me, so why seek more guidance? And that happens to us. We get to thinking, well, it wouldn't, why should I fast and pray? Nothing took place. We well, see again, the motive is wrong in your heart. You don't fast and pray. The, the biggest mistake people make with fasting and praying, they're trying to move the hand of God to do what they want God to do. You're trying to force God into something. You can't force God into anything. And, 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 and God is continually doing what? He's continually looking to see what's going on in here. All right? Uh, and that's the reason he allows us to be tested. He wants to see what's in our hearts. And, and if he didn't uh, allow us to be tested to see what's in our hearts, well, you're talking about a mess, we'd be a bigger mess than we are. Somebody say amen. We're always striving for God to speak to us, though trying to to be worthy. We're always striving for God, and, and, and we're always trying to be worthy. And even through all through that worthiness, folks, we get ourselves in a position, if we're not real, real careful, of, of bless God, of, of not being worthy, and we don't even realize that. And, and I think, again, we have used the name Christianity as a covering that I deserve all this stuff. Okay? Well, Lord, I deserve this. I'm a, see, that's the reason I said to you, and it, and it just rocked the boat of so many people, and it will continue to do that across America when I've said to the church, the 91st Psalm does not belong to Christianity. The 91st Psalm belongs to the law. And oh, they get, oh, uh, some get irate. Well, get irate. I'm right. If, the, if that covering was there, you wouldn't have to worry about any plague coming nigh your dwelling, would you? But it does, doesn't it? Okay? You won't have to worry about uh, 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 all these people that's going to be ramsacking homes and, and, and killing people for food and everything. You won't have to worry about that, will you? 
Because the 91st Psalm will cover you if you keep the law, if you keep the covenant, all right? And that's the covenant. And I, I'm not sure how we're going to ever get that fully uh, into the hearts and the minds of a lot of these people because, they, they, you know, they have been taught so much that somehow, somehow, when they became a Christian, that God had already got rid of His chosen people. And of course, they know it's called the Jews, and it's not, okay? Uh, and so He got rid of them, and so now we're everything they should have been, but they decided not to be it, so we are, and we get all that. You don't get it without the fulfillment of it. You don't get it without doing the work, all right? You have a job, you don't get paid to the end of the week or whatever the agreement is, the contract, the ketubah as, uh, in Hebrew, as, as to whether or not you've you got to fulfill, then you get, God's the same way. You fulfill the word, then you're blessed. Then the payoff comes. And, and we've tried, like I said, we, we have tried for so long and so hard, and we've done so much of that backwards, brothers and sisters, that honest to golly, that, that, that we, you know, we kind of got everything, we kind of got everything messed up. Um, let me see here if I've got, uh, I think that, where am I at here? While you were in the condition of not being able to set your love upon him as he set his love upon us because not realizing you've been totally accepted by him, but you've not totally accepted uh, by him, but you've not totally accepted him. If, because if you totally accepted him, then you've come to the realization he's God. He is the creator. He said, let there be light, and there was light. There wasn't any challenges to that. He didn't pray and fast for 40 days and 40 nights. He simply said, let there be light, and there was light. And he began to what? Speak in existence and create this earth that we stand on today and, and, and all the fish and all the, everything that was within the sea and above the sea, on the ground, humans themselves. But you see, again, we get ourselves in this place of, of, of not being able to, to realize that. Uh, the, the, he starts working for us because now we are what? We, we can never, uh, never be unworthy again if we'll apply ourselves to the Word. Now, if you don't apply yourself to the Word, you're not worthy, okay? We can be unprofitable but never unworthy. Not in his eyes. Because why? We have already met the, met, met the conditions. You, you, you passed the first test because you see, now again, we don't like rules, but you passed the first set of rules saying, you want to get into eternal life, you have to receive my son. And that what he came to this earth to do, of which at that point in time the law could not do, which was a curse to us. But he came and did it. So you, you did what? You applied, you applied that, and you received eternal life. Now God has rules for everything that you can imagine that you have need of. There's rules for that. If you will do this, I will do that. If you don't do this, I can't do that. And see, it's not because you get to think, well, God doesn't love me. Yeah, he didn't. Why didn't he heal me? He doesn't love me. That's not, that's not what the problem There is a problem somewhere else. There's a problem far deeper and surpasses that. And that's what you've got to get educated to enough that you can even come into a, a, a place of possibility thinking that it could be possible that that could be your problem. Now, when you get there, guess what? You're going to find the answers. As long as you're running around here saying, well, I'm not worthy, quit saying that. You are worthy. You make yourself feel unworthy because why? You're outside the Word. You stay within the Word and you will stay worthy by your flesh's with God, as I said, you, you, you're, you're, you're worthy. You now, you've been blood-bought. You're there unless you're stupid enough to throw it away at yours. All right? Now, uh, l let's see. It says, uh, Matthew 28. Let me, let me uh, clo close up here with Matthew 28. Go with me with all kind of zesto to Matthew 28. Now, 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I'm in 28, 18. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. 
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the end of the world. Now, what I love about this is that 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 this he's inviting us into the fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's what he's doing here. He's inviting us into that fellowship where it is going to be possible for us what? To fellowship with him. He's saying, though, he said, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, what are his commandments? Oh, that you love one another. Yes. But he says, I came not on my own. I was sent by my father. I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. He said, I don't do anything but that which the Father tells me to do. Now, what's that saying? He didn't come with his own agenda. And somehow, we bought this bag of rocks of believing that, that bless God, somehow, he came with a new agenda. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. What did he say? It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In that order. He, he you know, he, in other words... He says, I don't know anything but that which the Father's told me. Well, if he didn't know anything that which the Father's told, him, told us, then don't you think God and all of his infinite wisdom, all, Yahweh himself, would have said, look, boys and girls, I'm sending my son. Now do away with all this old covenant business over here. And you'll start your own New Testament in the church, and you won't need the law anymore. But let me tell you what happens without the law. Let me tell you what happens without the law. Without the law... You can't be rightly related to God, and you can't be rightly related one to another. The relationship, the chain, that chain is broken, and there's no longer a relationship there because what you've done is you've now got yourself into a position where you're being a lone ranger, and that's what the church became. We, we, we got ourselves in a position of being out here, and bless God, not realizing that we have to conform to the Word. The Word's not going to conform to us. We have to conform to the Word. And when he said here, when he said here in that, in that uh, 20th verse, teaching them, teach them to observe all things. You have to teach them to observe. That's what we're trying to do this weekend. We're trying to give you some possibility thinking here of being able to move you into an area where you're going to begin to, to question your relationship with the Father through the Son. Just you, you, you're, you're going to go one on one, stand to the with the Father, and and, and through the Son Yeshua, and, and through the guidance, the teaching of the Rahakadish, the Holy Ghost. This thing is going to begin to unfold to you, because you're going to you're going to finally have to come to grips with the fact: Am I doing this right, or am I doing this wrong? We're always struggling to be worthy. It's not knowing how to struggle, but how to enter in. And that's what it's about. Knowing how to enter in. If you can understand how to enter in the rest of this thing, there won't be a struggle to it. No, knowing how to come unto God's, into God's presence and how to see ourselves in Christ. You must get to the place where you can see yourself in Christ. And you can understand. But you see, unfortunately for you and I, there are rules that pertain to all this thing. And if, if, you're, if you're not willing, if you're not willing to understand that, again, folks, that's the reason we're the mess we are. How can you, how can you be out here with your own agendas, think that you're going to separate into a world that's supernatural world, that the, the voice of God and the guidance of God has to come through a noggin that is all saturated with all this stuff. I can do all things through Christ Jesus strengthens me. I don't need to fast and pray. All I need to do is use the name of Jesus. And, and bless God, I know there's sin in my life, but God overlooked that because I'm just going to use the name of Jesus. We think the name of Jesus is, bless God, synonymous with all the success of our lives, no matter where we're living at in the Word. And it's, it's not. It only, again, works when it's applied properly. If, if, if I was to give you a... a, a a, a, a bogus set of keys to my van sitting out there, you couldn't get, you couldn't get the, the, the door unlocked because the key wouldn't fit. The same thing applies to this. You're trying to use a key to open up a door that won't open. Won't even fit, won't even fit in the lock to open it. But yet you have believed, if I can just keep on, if I can just pray another day, 
And, and then we got into the thing I love in the charismatic movement, of course. If you'll give me all your money, okay, then I'm telling you, I'm telling you a hundredfold. Let me show you a few scriptures here. Now we're going to take up the offering. You write the last dime out of your accounts. This is how important this meeting is to you. And, and, we, and, and some of us were dumb enough to do it, and then some of us have just stayed broke because of it, right? I know people that sent their jewelry, sent everything they own to a guy. I waited about six months. I went to visit them because I just wanted to know. I said, surely it doesn't work that way. Tell me that it didn't work. Not only did it not work, we ended up losing our car because we sent all of our money. We couldn't pay a car payment. Is that what God wants for your life? What did that preacher end up with? Probably a new airplane. Come on. Listen, folks. I want you to understand something about big, big ministry. Those are big corporate wheels. There are millions of dollars orchestrating that, that corporation. That preacher is just there. The corporation runs. They're putting them, what do you think it costs for that preacher to be every day on, on one of those hookups up there? They're talking about a couple million dollars a month. Now, who do you know? that's got $2 million a month, every month, to put into television. But yet, some of you are sending them money. Some of you are, and what are they doing for your life? Huh? Well, now, Brother Deckard, I mean, I don't agree with the, the you know, this one guy doesn't believe in the, he doesn't believe in the rapture, but I mean, other than that, he's doing right. Then I'm going to tell you something. If you're sitting there, then you don't believe in the rapture. If you're giving money to that group, then you believe what they're preaching to be the truth. You better be careful what you're doing, because you're liable. Don't think you're not liable. You're helping those people spread something that's not a God just because there's one or two little things you don't agree with. You better get away from that whore. You better run. That thing's going to rise up and going to bite you in the hind side, and you're not even going to see it coming. Well, that's a little extra something. I don't cost anything. Well, it's time for us to... Uh, to uh, let, the, let, let go of this, and we'll come back at uh, 2 o'clock.